Before we uh, wrap up this with our final session with the panelists asking questions once again, uh, just just to make sure everyone's aware, we're gonna we're gonna ask questions for maybe 30 minutes, and then we'll wrap it up at around quarter till. That'll give people time to settle and ex exit the room uh, carefully, and um, so we don't have a mob ruling. And also, we're apparently we're running out of tape, so we need to wrap it up on time for technical reasons. Uh, and before we do wrap it up, I just want to make sure that everybody uh, here is is aware of how much, uh, on behalf of uh, Brian and the uh, religious diversity. Uh, uh, group here that uh, that we're grateful for you guys coming. We really appreciate the comments, and I want to make sure everyone gives all of our speakers uh, a big round of applause even before the end of the meeting. Because <laughs> my only re my only regret really is that the smoke from Idaho has made it so some of our visitors from out of state can't see the mountains because that's one of my favorite things about living here. All right, so without any further ado, then, we'll go ahead and, and pass the microphones around again to ask questions, um, in particular, uh, based on our last session. And um, please remember to turn on the mic if you're going to ask a question or respond to it so that we can capture your uh, response or your question on, uh, on the audio. Thank you. I'd, I'd like to ask a question about the uh, hate crime conviction of uh, 15 Amish uh, zealots. <laughs> who cut the hair and beards of uh, those in their community that they didn't like, uh, and possibilities of, what, what did it say, 20, oh, tw not 20, a 10 year prison sentences? Anyway, the, the NPR report that I heard suggested that the press was an important part of, of the, the hate crime bill, which was passed, what, a couple of years ago, three years ago, uh, and then the conviction of people who, who simply uh, cut hair of people as uh, far more serious than, than rape. Um, and I find that an interesting kind of issue. So I'm, I'm curious, how do you see as journalists the hate crime issue, the evolution of the hate crime uh, kind of notion, and the conviction yesterday of 15 Amish people? I guess I would say that the evolution of the hate crimes legislation, it had been, that, that legislation had been due for such a long time. I mean, it had been in the works off and on for what, 30 years? at least since the Civil Rights Movement and the Voting Rights Act. Um, so I would say it was a high time for the legislation. I'm not sure I completely agree with the conviction because I'm not sure that the crime fits the punishment totally. That answer your question? That's it. That's, well, go ahead. Let me, go let ahead. me speak to a, a more local example. Okay. Um, because we passed hate crimes legislation in, in Utah. I'm getting old, my memory's getting bad. But, um, but I covered it for six years, watching them try to <coughs> pass hate crimes legislation. And the big sticking point was it included a category for sexual orientation. And in Utah, the religious component that is sort of an underpinning of our legislature blocked it for six, for six years even when the Mormon church came out and said, as they sometimes do, they, they, they said they didn't oppose the legislation of, as drafted. They didn't say they endorsed it, but they didn't say they didn't endorse it. They just said they didn't oppose it. And so I think that's a perfect example where that undercurrent has a major influence on moving public life and public policy. Um, I would agree. I'm not sure if I agree with what happened yesterday. I don't know that the punishment fit. I, and I don't really either, but that, that's that's where I'm afraid to to, to, to yeah. say more than I did, because I don't have that much detail on the background of the case. I apologize. It takes a while to get here from South Carolina, <laughs> so I spent most of yesterday in an airplane or a car. <laughs> so. I run a foundation, Foundation for Religious Diplomacy. If I wanted to get something out to the religious writers of America, is there a terminal that I could go to that would get a thousand people with one email, or do you have to get to know each one of you individually? www.religionnews.org and send out a press release to all of their clients. And they have sacred and secular clients all across the country and internationally. Okay. So that would be one really rapid way. I mean, it'll, it'll cost you something, but I don't know what it'll cost you. Uh, and so I don't have the rates. I see. But it's basically a press release service, it's like that, but, it, but it's pretty inexpensive, I think. Great. Religion. 
because religious replies, I mean, most religion writers do have some frame of reference and are religious. There was a lot of thought for a long time that they weren't, but they're not. They're pretty much, reporters are pretty much like everybody else. No. Yeah, they are, in one <laughs> sense. I mean, they, they, they're, they're like everyone. And, well, they are in that they get married and they go to church and <laughs> they have children and they, you know, dogs. dogs. <laughs> they eat and drink, they go to the PTA meetings. I mean, you know, everybody thinks they have horns and a tail. But, um, that's Mormon. It's just a couple that <laughs> oh, that's Mormon. Mormon reporters. Mormon reporters. <laughs> Only Mormon reporters. Jeez. Anyway, it's the Religion News Writers Association and, and or www.religionnews.com. That'll take you to um, Religion News Service. And that's the way you can get out and get out a uh, um, press release with no trouble whatsoever. What, I'm going to follow up. What, are you, what, what has been the, uh, the big news story in terms of, you, you've, you've seen a lot of news over the last few years. In terms of my interest is religious um, conflict in, and the way it's engaged. Do you see any positive news stories, um, any trends, especially in the Middle East, that would give you hope that there are new ways of interreligious engagement that are impacting uh, possibilities for change over there? We only get the, uh, it's the really 2,000 in the streets, but not the, uh, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, it has been five years since I've been to the Middle East. I led a student trip to Jordan. Um, I see in the Arab Spring and in other things happening in Arab countries an opening up that I think could go from being a pinhole to an actual hole the size of a fist, metaphorically, that would bring forth and allow for much more in a religious dialogue. I I think that at the beginning that will be, that will still be grassroots. I agreed with what you said earlier that it needs to be institutionalized. But I think that from the people when you when you when you interact with people in the Middle East, the first things they want to know are the things that they think about Americans that they want to know if they're true or not. You know, they want to know if 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 you only watch television and you and you have a great big huge car. And you know you live in a mansion, and I mean that sounds ridiculous, but a lot of people do ask those questions. Just people on the street, and they want to talk to you. They'll learn English because my Arabic was non-existent, just to discuss that kind of thing with you. So um, I would say that there is hope. I think it's going to have to be driven by a lot of personal involvement and probably a good bit of risk taking on the part of Americans. Let me follow up on that Middle East issue. <coughs> Most of my terrorist friends uh, are not religious. Most of your terrorists are not religious. And, uh, they're, not, it's, they're not religious. It's interesting. They're um, spiritual, but not religious. <laughs> one, of, one of my students uh, came to me one day um, in uh, Birzeit University in, in Ramallah and said that his mother had been offered $50,000 for him to become a suicide bomber. Uh, the money was coming from uh, an outside source from Iran. And uh, $50,000 was a lot of money to a poor Palestinian family. Um, and the interesting thing was that he was a Christian. It was a Christian family. It wasn't a Muslim family. It was a Christian family. And they were recruiting suicide bombers. Um, and his argument was that, that this was a pure business deal, that this was not a religious issue, uh, and that it's reported as a religious issue. Um, and when I t interview people, um, the head of the Palestinian Liberation Army, for example, uh, the issue was not religious identity. It was using religious symbols to mobilize and activate this, the, the people. And, uh, and one of my former students, who is a professor at Bar Ilan University in Tel Aviv, um, said, you guys don't understand. He says, I'm, I'm Jewish, but I'm an atheist. I'm an American citizen. I'm an atheist. Um, and uh, 
he says, I don't believe in God, but I, I feel like I have a, a responsibility to redress grievances, anti-Semitic grievances of the past thousand years. Um, and so it was, it was an ethnic, tribal, but not a religious variable. And I'm wondering if the press really gets that. Um, and again, I've been shot at several times in the West Bank and Gaza and other places. Um, and every time when I pursue, I, one, one group I pursued and established a fun relationship with them. And again, there was no, there was no commitment to a religious issue. It was tribal identity and retribution and contempt. Randy made a really good point in terms of es exporting uh, immoral pop culture to the world. The dominant television programs that come over Palestinian uh, television are Baywatch in Dallas, uh, reruns of, of the old programs, and that's America. Uh, and there was no real religious component to it. It was very different. So I'm, I'm just, I, I s cite that as kind of a personal story and wonder if we don't need to get the story a little, a little better. I don't know if, if we understand it, but I think that goes to some of the points that we've made about sort of, you have to learn how to, and, and know to drill down because a lot of things get covered on the surface, but we either don't know where to go or we don't have the relationships yet to figure this stuff out. And they just, they take a kind of a time and patience and sourcing that, that um, is getting to be really rare in, in my business. So you make a good point. I agree that you make a good point. The only thing I'm thinking is, how would that reporter get another two paragraphs to describe the tribal ethnic conflict? You know, and so because part of this is not just how the Western press views this; it's how Western readers view it. And to, I mean, that that's where we just were way off the mark in Afghanistan. It's taken years for there to be some gradual, small understanding of the motivation of all that's going on in that nation. Because I just don't think there's, it's so different from, you know, developed Western countries that there's just no, there's the, nobody thinks, nobody stops and thinks about the, about the difference long enough. And the problem is, you don't stop to think about it long enough, and I'm impugning the press here. Two, the very time to do that is not being allowed to most reporters right now. A lot of this is industry driven, and it's competition, it's the internet, it's a whole series of factors that are, you know, undermining what could be better coverage. I was a uh, part of a symposium last March in Orlando over evangelicals and the media, and uh, you know, the, the statement of what was the big media story of the year, religious media story, is that a, a Mormon is going to have the primary position of, of one of the parties, you know, for the first time in history to be a major political figure and run for the presidency. And, and some of the implications, now we were just talking just a moment ago in the break, that there has definitely been a kind of uh, hesitation to examine the, the LDS faith in the media. There's, there's beginning to be inklings of it. Uh, the Romney campaign has kind of done everything he can to kind of stay out of that and not, not encourage any of that kind of discussion. What I'm more curious about is, and I talk to my LDS friends who say there's kind of a fear and an excitement about a possible Romney presidency. There, there's an enthusiasm for him as a candidate by some, but a fear that their faith will be examined and scrutinized in new ways nonstop for the next four years possibly. Do you, how do you sense uh, the religious, community, religious writers community will examine Mormonism or not examine it post a victory for Mitt Romney if, if he wins? Will it be scrutinized more or will they kind of keep hands off, the religious community? It's the Mormon moment. NBC did a whole hour, two hours. Everybody's doing the Mormon story. They're everywhere. It's start, yeah, it's starting to come in a little bit, yeah. Yeah, and so, um, and some other people have been doing some of those stories for a while, but they just weren't getting the same level of attention. Right. Um, I think it's a, it's, it's a double-edged sword if you're a Mormon. The most interesting things about the faith's theology in some ways are the things that they don't really want to talk about um, and the things that make them, um, you know, suspect with other faith traditions. Um, if you start talking about 
uh, garments and you know magic underwear some people call them you start talking about things like collab or heavenly mother those are things that don't resonate with other mainstream Christians and um, so I think it plays both ways in, in one way m more examination more stories more drilling down to get at what this is really about is really good for the conversation because it breaks down barriers between between faith traditions and from people who don't really understand each other but I think it's you know it's the thing that has demonized Mormons in the past and may maybe they don't want to go there I don't think I don't think if, if Romney is president I don't think those kinds of stories are going to go away so here's here's my question to ask religion reporters, and I, I and I spend a lot of time speaking with religion reporters, and so I have great sympathy for the demands placed on journalists today. You know, they're asked to do 27 things in one day, and and then write a blog post about it as well. Um, but so here's my question. So you mentioned that there are these sensationalistic aspects of Mormonism. But why do reporters have to focus on those? Because those are, like you mentioned, you know, some of the more esoteric theology about Kolob and such. Those are not things that Mormons themselves ever talk about, or rarely do. I mean, that's just not central to Mormonism. That is as, you know, what it is, what that, <laughs> what that is to Mormonism is what, you know, the more esoteric beliefs of, Catholic, of Catholics would be the Catholicism. But nobody goes and asks Paul Ryan, you know, do you really believe in X, Y, and Z? Or, you know, nobody asks Paul Ryan to defend the statements of popes made in the 19th century. So why is it that journalists do have to focus on this? Is it just because Mormons are new to them? New and unknown. Yeah, I mean, I guess I guess my response to that would be, um, um, well, there, there are there are plenty of exotic things about Mormonism that is actually that are central to the faith, right? Mormons really do believe in a book that was written on golden plates and translated by somebody in the 1800s, right? I mean, Mormons really do believe that. It seems to me that's, you know. If you want to talk about Mormonism, that's reasonable to sort of cover that as an important aspect of the faith, and I would hope that most members of the LDS faith would be comfortable themselves talking about that to reporters or, or to others. It just seems to me like there's often a disconnect between what you actually would hear in Mormon meetings, what Mormons say to each other, and the way the faith is often portrayed, um, you know, in, in the national press. Not always, and I don't, I don't want to, I, I actually also hate it when Mormons go around with this persecution complex because I think we could probably get over it. Um, but I do sometimes wonder whether there isn't too much focus on things that are only going to seem salacious rather than central to the faith. disagreement about the nature of God, right? Different points of view on, on, on the nature of God. I thought that was the story. I thought that was the reason, I mean, that was the story that we should be talking about, about why certain people don't think Mormons are Christian. And what I was asked to put in the story was funny underwear, where's the Garden of Eden? And so I think that part of, part of the thing is um, a lack of a knowledge base about the faith drove some editors to think that we needed to go to the more salacious, more shelf doctrine stuff, things that are seem more weird and more out of their mainstream Christian or Jewish or evangelical personal experience. And I don't, I don't think it's fair either. I, I think that's the reality of what happens sometimes. Can I ask kind of a follow-up question? Sure. I think it might fit nicely with the discussion we're having. 
because I'm interested in um, kind of the spectrum. As reporters, you get to decide what you write about. I suppose your editor gets to decide whether it goes to print. You can comment on that if, I've, if I'm mistaken or not. I think that's, I think that's fair. I mean, okay. if you're the beat reporter, you, by and large, I mean, you know what's happening and you sort of follow the story and you know, here's the next thing that I want to explore and okay. here's why. But a couple things are happening, I think, in journalism. Um, and as an example, when I went to the AP in Salt Lake City, there were 12 people. There are two people there now. Hmm. And they're still open seven days a week, 365 days a year. So you can't do as some of those stories that you I wanted see. to do, and that's just a that's just a hard reality. Practical reality. Um, but yeah, editors have control sometimes over what flies and what and what doesn't. So I mean, Jennifer, I appreciated your description of a rational, methodological, methodologically driven approach to creating a story, whether it's about the Hogel Zoo and Mormons visiting it, or something happening down at the Cathedral of the Madeline. Mm -hmm. And the, there's kind of an, a scientifically driven or scientific method base to it all. Mm -hmm. So to kind of follow up on David's uh, question, you basically get to decide what religion is and what religion is not. And this is to you as well, Cecile. So what are, what's the envelope on either end? What's the ultra-orthodox where you just say, ah, okay, yeah, I'll cover those guys? And then what is the radically unorthodox where you just say, that's no longer religion? Oh, okay, now I understand. Does that make well, sense? Yeah, it does make sense, and it's kind of an interesting question because I've spent a lot of time covering polygamy in Utah, and I've spent in particularly a lot of time with the FLDS. And, um, and, my, and I can tell you that like, there's really an arc for me in terms of covering those those people and in that I went from um, sort of understanding them on a sort of a surface level and, and I should say that I'm not condoning any of the crimes that have commi been committed in that society but they've moved for me from being a news story about a church and XYZ that happened to being a culture story because they're a different culture and I come at them really differently now than when I used to. And what, what was the criteria that you brought to the table or what was the piece of the recipe that you just said, that's no longer religion, that's culture? Was it the criminal element? No, that, that's a, I, I think it's when I actually started to, to get to know them. To, I mean, I was one of the first people on the ranch in Texas. Uh -huh. And, um, and uh, when you start to kick the door open and you start to see that, um, you know, Mormons and evangelicals and polygamists and Episcopalians and Catholics all love their kids the same way, all want their kids to be healthy and happy, all want to have a roof over their house. When you start to, like, m for me, when I started to move away from seeing um, them as different and other, then I started, I think I grew in my respect for other people, and so I became a better listener. And, um, and I hope a better reporter because, I mean, I can see this with the Mormon church, the things when I bump up against editors who say, well, you know, it's all about the funny underwear. I'm like, well, no, 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 it's really about all these other things. But sometimes you have to fight to get those other things into the story. And if you're, if you're doing reporting the way much reporting is getting done now, you're only going to get maybe one shot. You're not going to be a religion reporter full time who's going to get to go to lunch every other Friday with a group of 10 Mormon guys who, you know, who are sunstone thinking Mormons and who like to dissect everything. That, and, you know, I'm not going to get that time. I, that started for me about two years ago. I stopped getting that time. And it really shifted my ability to do what I thought was, you know, the job I really wanted to do the way I wanted to do it. Um, I don't know if that really answers your question, but. Like the deeper I, I get into this conversation, it, it just it just changes. So we hear a lot about the the bias in the press, and and I said maybe more so because we are in Utah and so we have this Republican base and everything else, and we feel like, you know, you you hear the press referred to as Obama's lapdog, and 
you know, that he's, he's kind of running everything and everything will go that way. So in this context, though, um, does, do you find that, that people of faith traditions have maybe a general mistrust maybe of reporters or of the press because of the perception the press is more biased towards the liberals, towards the Democrats, and therefore any reporting may seem to be um, not in favor of, or, or even anti-religious in some ways. And maybe that's because of lack of information by some, but you know what I'm saying? It's anyway, not you necessarily biased uh, in favor of the liberal towards the Democrats, but just biased, period. When I teach my journalism students, I teach them that it only takes one rotten apple to just ruin the future for everybody as far as reporting goes. I mean, a, a source who has been seriously burned by a reporter, either quoted out of context, had his or her remarks misrepresented, been put in some other kind of an untenable situation because some jerk reporter just didn't do his or her homework. It ruins it for the rest of us. I've spent weeks cultivating people that um, had been burned who, after some interaction with me, were willing to talk to the press. So, um, and I think relationships are everything, you know. Um, I spent three years getting one guy's phone number. Three years <laughs> to get one guy's phone number. And now the running joke is, I don't know why I didn't call you before, you know, because, <laughs> but you have to earn it. I mean, yeah. you have to earn those relationships. And something David said about the Mormon, um, the, um, oh shoot, I'm having one of those moments. I get them more and more these, these days. Um, oh, about the, the sort of Mormon narrative, right, of a persecuted people. Well, if you start out reading what I've written from that point of view, it's not going to matter what I wrote. Sure. I mean, it's just not going to matter. I, I think I told Boyd earlier today, I've been working on some stuff about Mormons and um, Romney and military deferment. So I was referred to a person who shall remain nameless, who I don't know, who I don't know, but I wrote an email the way I always do, saying, this is who I am, you know, I've covered the church for this number of years. I'm working on this thing. And he just wrote back, I don't talk to unscrupulous reporters. He's never met me. I don't, and this is the second time I've had this experience in the last month where they, and, and it's both in the context of writing stories about Mormons. They're just. So there is a mistrust there. Th I think yeah. there is a mistrust. And, and it's interesting, and I'm not sure if it's happening right at this moment because of the Mormon moment that there's a more heightened sense of, I'm not gonna say anything because I've already decided that you don't like us. Um, I actually have a really good relationship with the church PR department <laughs> and, um, and I think I'm generally considered to be pretty fair and pretty knowledgeable because I've spent so much time with them over eight years. But, you know, I put it on the wire, I sent it out there, I don't know who reads it, I don't know how they perceive it, but I think, you know, both pieces have to be considered. Where am I coming from? What, is, what have I done? What does my record tell you? Mm -hmm. And um, you know, and, and who are you as the consumer? What are you reading? How are you interpreting it? Because I think that's a huge piece of it. 